of the National Lawyers Guild. And I thank Deb for her kind words, but it's really been a, an organizational effort of the National Lawyers Guild since 1936 to defend the right of people to dissent. We were at our national conference in New Orleans on Friday morning when we received the first phone calls at 7.21 a.m. about the raids in Chicago and Minneapolis and the approach to activists in other places around the country. And, you know, the day before, we'd been holding a seminar on the law, the material support law, which is the basis for this investigation and prosecution. And we spent an entire afternoon talking about it on Thursday, only to wake up on Friday and see it being applied in a new and frightening way. Because what we're seeing today, in the past, this is a law that has been used against people that in many cases can comfortably be painted as the other in some way or another. Whether it's Palestinian Americans, whether it's people that can be painted as extreme in their political views. But what we woke up to on Friday morning was seeing the extension of that law to people who are grounded in the political movements that we're a part of, in the anti-poverty movement, in the anti-war movement, in the solidarity movement, in a movement for justice against racism, for gay and lesbian rights, for the rights of women, for equality, for peace, for freedom. And that means that all of us can be targets. These laws started in 1996 under a Democratic administration. They're being enforced now under a Democratic administration. We can talk about the Patriot Law passed in the aftermath of the attacks of 9-11 by a Republican administration, but extended and enforced and carried out by a Democratic administration and a Democratic Congress. This is about a series of laws that give increasing power not subject to review to the president and to the national security establishment. Let's be objective about what happened on Friday, whether you support it or not. The internal security forces of the United States, increasingly integrated on a local, state, and national level, carried out a raid using law enforcement internal security agents from the local and national internal security agencies against dissidents who oppose government policy. That's an objective, accurate description of what happened, even if you support those raids. They're using laws that were passed that in this July the Supreme Court interpreted to say it might just make President Carter a felon for providing election aid in Lebanon. Because you can't go to Lebanon and teach people how to have elections unless you work with Hezbollah, which is one of the major political parties in Lebanon. And the Supreme Court said this July that having meetings and talking to these prohibited foreign organizations is a crime, even if you're just teaching them on how to go to the United Nations and file a legal petition, or you're teaching them how to resolve conflict. Now, many of you may have been part of the anti-apartheid movement in the 1980s. A movement from the African National Congress was declared a terrorist organization by the Reagan administration. Had these laws been in effect then, the entire anti-apartheid movement would have been guilty of providing material support to terrorism. Or you may have been involved in the community in, Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, working and talking and dialoguing with the FMLN, a party which now leads the government in El Salvador. Or you may have listened to the election when President Obama said, we have to talk to our enemies in order to negotiate peace. What the material support for terrorism law says is you can't talk to your enemies. It's not material support that matters. It's not providing money or financial aid that you're talking to people. Now the Supreme Court says, well, you can talk about anything you want, but you can't do it in a coordinated fashion. Now, at the same time, they say the determination of what's coordinated is very fact-intensive, meaning we're not going to set any bright lines that protect people who might go and talk to someone that the government, in its unreviewable executive authority, has designated as someone you can't talk to. So if you talk to someone, coordinated or not, you run the risk of prosecution, because it's a fact-based inquiry. 
meaning that the talking is probable cause, enough to open an investigation, enough to get a search warrant, enough to raid a home, enough to issue a subpoena to people, to make them go in front of a grand jury and answer questions. Who do you know? Who do you talk to? What do you think? And if you don't answer them, you can sit in jail for four, six, eight, eighteen months until the grand jury term ends. This will be a long struggle. We'll have to stand by our friends. I have to say I was so moved by everything, but by particularly my sister Jess Sundin's words to start out, her history, her dedication. I mean, it, was, it personalizes this to remember who we're talking about. And so, I mean, this is a very personal struggle. It's a very legal one, too. It's going to be a long one. It's going to be a difficult one. I stand with the people under subpoena and under attack. I hope you all do, too. The people of Colorado.